Okay, my friends, my name is Ari Nystad. I'm a freelancer in innovation and technology. I work for the NTNU in Trondheim. I have been enjoying the contact on R&D and innovation uh, here in Brazil since 2010, when Petrobras joined a center for integrated operation in Norway. I'm pleased I'm your session chair this uh, two and a half hours. We have um, five very interesting topics and speakers. We collected the speakers at the table last evening, so we had a heated debate of a very simple question. What, what is digitalization? What do we mean with it? And if we can answer that question, all of us, uh, when we leave after these two and a half hours, I would be very happy. It's a lot of different opinions about uh, this work. We are going to invite the speakers to have 15 minutes each, and then uh, five minutes question and answer uh, and debate or opinions. And then we also have a coffee break to the mingling uh, time. And we, at the end, we have reserved half an hour to a round table discussion. So we invite the speakers up here and uh, I'm going to share some sort of a dialogue between the audience and the speakers. So we would like very much to, to then address what's next actually. What can we do together? What can we get going? Maybe with the reflection of the, uh, the last session. I will be very brief in uh, talking about the business opportunities, but I have been in the oil and gas business 40 years. I was manager of uh, petroleum resource management at the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. One single objective, maximize the value for Norway. We had 100 billion barrels, originally oil and gas, as a recoverable. We have depleted not exactly 50%, but we still have roughly 50, 55 billion barrels back. It's a huge resource base. The perspective in Brazil, I would say that if you add some sort of expectation of the Santos Basin and the new opportunities, Brazil is in front of having maybe 100 billion barrels. It's a distribution there. But it is a vast amount of oil and gas resources if the world can absorb it and use it in an environmental friendly manner. And if we can convince the young people to work in oil and gas, the dirty business, the business that has, is actually currently under attack in the societies, at least in Norway and some other places in, uh, in other countries. But there are great opportunities. And when I go up in the helicopter and look down to the two offshore sectors, the two offshore sectors are the ideal partners they are the most significant also sectors in the world, industrially wise. The resource base is still there. Brazil has the double of the future than Norway, but still, we see a lot of the same companies, both on the oil company side and the supplier side. So the, the structure is there. And um, if we go into the use case, what is really the topic for the future in the oil and gas business? You see a, a, in the whole value chain, you see the same topics on the Brazilian continental shelf as at the Norwegian continental shelf. So from business side, it, it should be a lot of opportunities to get this academic and research and innovation environment to pool resources and go together. And maybe this topic could be some sort of a future topic that also in addition could enhance the collaboration uh, um, and I think that digitalization is on every lips in every company. And the big boss, they say, we have to go digital. And then they whisper to us, but can you please tell us what is it? So that's the introduction for this um, session. We have uh, the five speakers, both from um, NTNU in, Tron, uh, in Trondheim, University of Oslo. We have the Federal University, Rio Grande do Sul, Federal University of Santa Catarina, and Federal University of Bahia. We are coming back to the, to the different uh, names, but let me then introduce Eric Monteiro, the first speaker. 
He's professor at uh, NTNU. And um, please, uh, Erik. Um, he, you are you are working where? Well, um, both at uh, NTNU and and uh, the University of Oslo. Um, but I'm uh, at the computer science department at NTNU, uh, data technic. Computer science professor, computer science. and he has selected a challenging issue: organizational and human aspects of digitalization in oil and gas, which is also a very hot issue when we discuss with suppliers and our companies. Please, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, um, computer science is um, a relatively young discipline. Um, it's also broad in the sense that uh, within the discipline it covers everything from uh, the design and manufacturing of you know the hardware uh, to you know algorithms and databases and search and methods to to develop uh, software as well as the corner that I'll cover today which um, is the um, the social the human the organizational conditions around um, uh, effective, purposeful use of um, uh, digital solutions. Um, and uh, a particular reason for also including this uh, latter emphasis is that our field as a computer science <laughs> is chronically um, filled with, uh, you know, hype, and, and, and extremely high expectations and calls for revolutions and, and, and you know, dramatic shifts um, and a healthy dose of, of um, you know, skepticism is, is um, often sensible. Um, uh, and as a reminder, um, I and I'm sure you know, other people in, in, in the audience uh, you know, grew up as a young researcher in the first wave of AI. So, I mean, today it's, you know, <coughs> machine learning and AI uh, seem to come with, you know, as, as I said, on everybody's lips. Um, but in fact, um, um, it's not new. Uh, and it's, you know, strikingly similar in its way, the way it's, you know, the visions and some of the proclamations made. So, um, um, uh, understanding the possibilities, but also uh, being, uh, um, you know, careful about uh, the necessary preconditions that come with effective and purposeful use, uh, including the organizational ones. That's the, uh, that's the, um, that's the team. Uh, uh, I've worked um, mostly in, in two domains what I'll talk about here, but also uh, I have a stream of work in, in healthcare, mostly in Norway, but also in the sort of global south, Africa, India. Uh, but uh, the context here is Bru21, um, which is this initiative that Ariel is, is, is uh, coordinating at NTNU, which is a you know, broad interdisciplinary emphasis on, on digitalization in oil and gas, I would say, um, starting with the geosciences and then subsequently involving the digital side and uh, the Sirius, which uh, is, is coordinated by David here in Oslo, um, which um, starts with the informatics, the computer science, and then involves the geosciences. So that's the, um, that's the backdrop. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, science of high expectations um, is not uh, very difficult to come about. This is uh, more or less uh, coincidental uh, or arbitrary, you know, selection. They, they, you know, abundantly present in popular press, but also in, in companies as well as academics. So given that, and also that there is a considerable, you know, history around digitalization prior to its you know, being coined as digitalization. So digitalization is a new label where we used to have numerous others, computerization, you know, ICT and organizations, which, uh, you know, beg the question, you know, what is genuinely new 
with the new label, which I think is, is uh, going back to Ariel's question. Is it just you know, a new label for basically the same thing, or is the, you know, are there genuinely um, uh, uh, novel aspects? So I think um, you know, taking stock of, of, and this is a brief talk, so I'll, I'll do you know, 25 years in one slide and, and one and a half minutes. So some of the insights that come out um, of the prior, that is, you know, couple of decades of studies into digitalization um, could be uh, explained as follows. Um, there was the, the so-called productivity paradox, which is the paradox between the apparently lack of correlation between investment in ICT, in digital solutions, and productivity. So studies found some found positive correlations, some found non-correlations, others found negative correlations. So this is the paradox. There is, you know, um, and, and from that, there was a growing, um, you know, recognition that the digitalization did not um, amount to an automation of, so, you know, if work consists of a sequence of tasks, it's not the automation that is the substitution of one of these tasks, you know, remove this, cut this, and, and inject the digital version, and then keep everything uh, else in place. No, there are non-local ripple effects, which means that there are complementaries, the side effects to the main effects are as important and as influential as the, the intended ones, which add up to um, recognizing digitalization more as a um, uh, you know, broad transformation more than targeted. There is also a strong tendency to exaggerate the short-term effects and underestimate the long-term. Um, so given this very, very, you know, brief recap of some of the insights. What then is, if any, is new? And, and what I'll do then is to suggest that there are, um, uh, on top of build, you know, building on, on what's, um, you know, basically the same, which is what I just outlined, there are some genuinely new interesting aspects. One is the way um, uh, which is particularly relevant for industrial IoT, the way sensors quite literally, you know, produce digital uh, representations from physical, you know, processes, objects, qualities, um, uh, feeding them to, to you know, algorithmically, um, you know, manipulation, uh, which, um, you know, create the, the phenomena uh, as much as, uh, you know, the originating, you know, physical uh, processes. Uh, there is also, uh, and I'll get back to that. This is, again, very different from, from uh, um, you know, the early days. There is also a, a, a significant push for what I would call the quantification of quality. Um, so economists point out the fact that, that um, some types of work, typically ones involving judgments, interpretations, assessment, you know, knowledge-based um, work, has been very slow to, to, to uh, immune largely to, to much of the push for, for uh, automation and digitalization. Uh, but what we're seeing is that um, um, uh, selected tasks within these um, you know, jobs of, of uh, um, um, you know, you have physicians and the interpretation of medical images. You know, certain parts can be automated, not the whole judgment. What this then leads to is the question of um, what does it take to make these uh, uh, representations, these digital representations, organizationally real, in the sense that people trust them, uh, trust them enough to make consequential action and decisions. Um, and uh, 
uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just, you know, um, cherry pick a couple of, of, of um, you know, brief uh, examples from, from um, the, the um, activities, the, the projects that we have been involved in. Um, yeah, so the, the setting is this. I'll talk about three themes. Trust. So, um, organizationally real re uh, digital representation. So, um, production engineers sitting in front of, of their screens, watching, monitoring, um, you know, sensor readings. Uh, this is the, you know, the setting is sub -C. So, you know, what you have are the sensor readings. There is no direct access to, you know, hands-on access to, to what's happening. Um, um, and do you trust, you know, the readings? Well, um, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, um, they already knew that some of this, you know, so sensors are notoriously uh, noisy and, and uh, um, you know, with short lifespans. And given subsea, um, you know, maintenance and replacement takes longer time. So what you have would be that you have heuristics, you have strategies where um, the competent, um, you know, response uh, is, you know, you could, you could, you know, curl up and, and, and cry and say that, you know, sensors should be correct. They should, you know, have the right, you know, readings. Or you come up with, um, these heuristics of working around what you have. You make the best of what you have, building to a certain extent of, to, uh, of um, you know, the readings, but also um, discussing and, 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 and collaborating with, with colleagues. Um, I see time is running. Um, uh, the uh, um, quantification. Uh, you know, the big data, and, and, and many of you, have, I'm sure, have seen these, you know, these Vs, um, you know, the characterization of uh, what's new. And I think um, the particularities, given an oil and gas setting, is not too much volume. Certainly, there are considerable volumes. But more striking, there is the combination of variety and veracity, that is, you know, the noise, which I just um, uh, pointed out, which lead to, um, um, you know, the situation where searching for data, um, it, you know, in the age of Googling, you know, Googling is a verb and not only a noun, um, is um, strikingly difficult in across uh, uh, you know um, you know the databases and data available because there are numerous formats there are different uh, you know types and, and and parts of the data which means that um, you know um, the uh, you know the world wide web is flat in a certain way um, different from what you have with with um, here um, you know historized uh, data in the oil and gas. This is a quote where, one, again, one of the, the production engineers were um, navigating in the maze of finding, you know, the right place to look for the information uh, he was looking for, um, and using, again, heuristics about knowing the age of the well and who was involved to help, um, you know, find what was, was there. Um, Lo yeah, I'll, you know, uh, last example, um, uh, wide drill pipe, uh, which is about the fact that um, it's an uh, attempt to increase the bandwidth, the, you know, the, the, the data flow during drilling from, you know, the very crude, you know, pulse, mud pulse uh, based, you know, five bits per second or whatever. Uh, to a significantly, you know, higher bandwidth with increased information. The point then being that will, you know, the increased data influence decision making? Well, um, certainly not uh, immediately. Um, 
the journalists we looked at, the first thing they did was to make sure that they filtered away all the additional information to get back the familiar, very crude outline of uh, uh, data that they were used to. Uh, so, um, um, and, and uh, so, more information does not automatically lead to other and different action taking. Yeah, there is also uh, an issue about the, the organizational silos between disciplines and geographies and parts and phases of, of uh, um, you know, the value chain of oil and gas, which regularly have, have um, um, you know, significant uh, uh, silos or, 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 or um, uh, hindrances between uh, the different departments, in this case, the journalists and the geologists. Um, so, possibilities, yes, but not automatic, uh, and careful attention also to the human and the organizational aspects is necessary. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to be strict with the time, so we have also um, absorbed the question and answer at this point in time. So we leave the discussion to the um, roundtable discussions. Uh, otherwise, we will not not enjoy the the advantage of the coffee break. I'm uh, inviting uh, Adnan Latif. They, you want to swap? Okay. So that's uh, very nice for me to know. <laughs> Then we invite uh, Mara Abel. We had a nice discussion last evening, uh, Mara. And, uh, you know, in Norway, uh, Abel is uh, a famous mathematician. So this family name is, a, um, <coughs> is triggering a lot of discussions in Norway. It's one of the most famous mathematicians in the world, actually. Uh, Institute of Informatic, Federal University of Rio Grande, Dusseldorf. And the topic is building ontologies for the petroleum domain. I would say one of the more complex issues to understand and grasp, but we are looking forward. Not really. Uh, I guess. That's better, I feel free <laughs> if I do like this. So uh, I am a lecturer in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in the Informatics Institute. Uh, also, I got a, a, a graduation degree in geologies and a master and, and uh, PhD in computer science. And I have been uh, studying knowledge representation for geologies mind for 30 years, but I started it. Uh, I started uh, in five years old, so that's why I look so young to have been studying so long. Okay, what we are, go we are going on now is the motivation to to build the uh, ontology models for geologists and exploration in general. What is ontology? It's the the discussion that we had on the dinner last night, and what we are doing with this. Uh, Theory, um, and in the end, uh, who who we are and my group, what we are doing so far. So uh, that's familiar to you. That exploration until we get the flow models, we go through a, a set of different tasks associated with different profiles of professionals that dealing with uh, models and system and proprietary files and tables and documents and so on. And it's a nightmare to integrate this information to get decision on which step. That's a big pain in the petroleum industry right now. The, these steps are integrated by what we call Earth model in exploration, which means that for each step, the professional builds mental or not so mental models that uh, helps to go to go through an application or through an of this task 
to others. The problem is that when you do that, each software that supports these tasks and each model that is used to go uh, to the next step, to interpret the data to the next step, is building over uh, what we call conceptualization, which means that the previous knowledge of this guy is used to interpret and to build a new model for the data. To build the model, he chose what we kind of like a, a cognitive lens that is based on entity types, which has meaning associated, and then uh, he also chose a view over the domain. I mean, if I am the one that takes care of uh, maintenance of this room, I have a different view of the same room than the guy that is scheduled uh, timetable for conferences here. So even if you have only one reality, hoping that you have only one reality, but we are not going through philosophy, uh, the choose the that you do over the reality is different even for the same person. If you get uh, 10 geologists in a room, you will have uh, probably 12 different views of the reality. So that's the problem about integrating models in, 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 and then the models that are, that are manipulated by system in petroleum area. Our, our approach to deal with this is that if we get a right model about geological objects and we can explicitly model the meaning of these objects based on formal definitions that can be understood by computers, not only by, by person, uh, I can provide an uh, uh, upper level tool to integrate these uh, files and application under it. So that's our general approach, is to, to see what is a geological object that has, are being manipulated by these systems and provide to them a formal definition in order then to be mapped from one sister system to other. Well, the point is that we use ontology to do that. So the point is, what is ontology? Uh, it's not really this. Ontology, indeed, is not uh, a, a graph of vocabulary. It's not a tree of names. It's not a list of names. Even if you use a list of names when you build an ontology. Ontology in this is a logical theory based on, on a strong basis on philosophy that helps you to define what exists in the world and how do you explicitly say what's the meaning of this word shared inside a community. I mean, when I use a word, I am using with such background meaning and I can communicate with you because I have the assumption that you keep in mind the same meaning than myself, which is not always true, but then people can help in the, this and take the ambiguity and, and uh, uh, put close the definitions. We are good in doing that and computers are bad in doing that. So the idea about using ontologies in computer science, ontology, as I said, is a philosophy branch, but the idea of using in computer science is to provide formal definition about the meanings in a way that computers can deal with this definition. We are today too based in the name. And the names, if I use uh, like uh, Daisy, I can be talking about the girlfriend of Duck Donald or I can be talking about the flowers. So names is not enough to carry the meaning of the words. So we, what we need is to provide a formal definition associated with the names or maybe with several names because I can use these in English and I can use Margarida in Portuguese and I am talking about the same concept, you know? So uh, names is not so important. What we do is to provide a formal definition about around this name then the computer can detect when we are not talking about the same names. So formal ontology deals with what we call ontological structures, the formal aspects of the object, the qualities of the object, which is not dependent on the particular nature, which wh what I am meaning is not dependent exactly on the instance that I have associated with the model. 
I define concepts in an abstract way, and then I can instantiate the concept in the instance for each application that I am running. So we do that based on a set of theories of philosophy. What are the main are essence and identity, parts and wholes, unity and plurality, dependence, composition and constitution, and the, the general theory about qualities. I don't go through all of this because you send me out uh, because of the time, but I will just try to explain some short examples. For example, when you talk about the concept of a reservoir, what you are talking about? What is a reservoir? Is the rock that you put uh, and you have petroleum inside, you don't put the nature of that put petroleum inside, but is the rock, is a rock with a special properties? Is the unit, I mean, is a limited volume of rock? What is exactly a reservoir? So when you say, when you talk about layers, about cores, about samples, about cuttings, we used to call off all of this reservoir. Oh, take a look in my reservoir. Look the porosity of this reservoir here. But we are not talking about the same thing. Computers cannot deal with this. Uh, and more of this, I have here, for example, I have one reservoir or two reservoirs. If I have two reservoirs, I d uh, a reservoir is not a rock, because a rock is a, an uncountable name. I mean, I don't have one rock, two rocks, three rocks. I has been the same way that I don't have one water, two waters, three waters. What I have is one cup of waters, one bottle of waters. Uh, uh, I have a sample of rock and so on. So we humans, we collapse vocabulary when you mention things but computers cannot deal with this. So we need to be precise when you talk with them. Uh, so we build models over the entities that provide the identity around the idea that we want to model. Then another problem in, in exploration is that uh, we use to collapse these words, like the piece of the rock or the volume of the rock and the rock itself. If I model this in separate way, I can, for example, extrapolate the rock properties like porosity and then do measure over the, the volume without having this mixed. Other prob problem that we have is dependence. Uh, so some objects are dependent, in in the, the, the idea of the, the, uh, the name is dependent on the other name. For example, I cannot have a student if I don't have a school. Not, I, I'm not talking about the instance of a student. I, I am talking about the idea of having a student. You cannot have an employee without a company that uh, contract the employee. So the concepts itself are dependent. When you model this in models, in data models, you need to put the concept that is the is dependent one along with the one that, uh, that uh, uh, allows the second concept to exist. So this help us in getting the full um, uh, meaning of the concepts. Um, <coughs> so for example, when I talk about contacts, boundaries of uh, geological bodies, I, I cannot have a contact with, without having the sedimentary unit, the geological unit itself. So it's necessary to model this in, in the models. Uh, so entities that are inseparable part of others should be model has entities itself, not has properties of the other model, not has quality of the other model, because do this helped me uh, go through several steps in systems and mapping the information correctly. Okay, but this is just a flavor about ontology. We have many ontological properties that we discuss and respect to, mo to, to build model. I suggest you to Google this this paper, which is a very nice and, and smooth uh, introduction about the theory of ontology. Uh, very easy to find. So uh, I will show you quickly some uh, projects that are going on in my research group with students and uh, dissertation and, and PhD uh, research. Okay, just this is, sorry. Go back, go back. 
yeah, it's here. Uh, we have developed uh, two large ontologies on exploration. One is for petrography, I mean this microscope scale, and we define the whole vocabulary for describing rocks under the microscope. So it's for sedimentary, chemical, hard rock, metamorphic, and igneous, and so on, every property. Uh, and this supports a system which is called Petrolet. Then we have another ontology in the scale of core and outcrop with the whole vocabulary, the definition of vocabulary for uh, uh, core description, sedimentary facies description. Also cover all, all, the, all the kind of rocks and all sedimentary structure, texture and fabric and so on in the scale of uh, visual scale core and outcrop. Uh, what we do with this, uh, we can use this for image indexing and searching. Here I have the, the picture indexing in the microscope in petrographic scale. Then I can search over the text using these uh, keywords because it's controlled keywords. So also uh, we are now publishing a, a paper in computer and geoscience proposing a core ontology for geology that derives uh, a top ontology ca called BFO. It's developed by Barry Smith. And then we propose the general main concepts for ontology in very high level, like uh, geological object, boundary, contact, structure, process, and age, which is a different uh, mo uh, kind of modeling thing. Uh, so it's done by Lua Garcia, my PhD student. Another PhD student is working with modeling of uh, time problems in modeling, which is process and events. We need to model this in a separate way then Sorry, I say to me that I ho don't have any time to finish. Okay, uh, we model this in a separate way. Here we, we see that we have a person, which uh, we call a continuum, and then, then the process of the, pers uh, po uh, the person living, which is calling occurrence or events. Uh, then we are uh, providing primitives to model these in geological process. To do what? To modeling geological process like uh, erosion, transport, deposition, cementation, litification, diagenesis, and so on. Uh, also, we have, uh, we are with a student which is in Oslo now in the COCAP CU Corporation that works in segmentation about domain ontology to help to get different professionals receive different views over the information in order to not get overload with the information that is stored in the database. Uh, also, we have uh, a master student work with uh, ontological measure of similarity in documents to recover documents for li large uh, lake, uh, lake uh, uh, of information, which we are doing uh, coordinated by Regis Cruz from Petrobras, who is here. Uh, also, we have machine learning apply over the, the data capture by using the petrographic ontology. And ha here is the previous result of Lucas in using four uh, reservoir uh, in three in Brazil, in Estalara from Peru. And then you can see the correlation with the 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 same the, the same correlation that we have with the geolog geologist uh, answer for the same analysis. Okay, that's all we have. Uh, developing domain ontology, we do by hand with the help of a good set of geologists uh, of my group. It's a lot of effort in doing that, but when you have very good and well-founded ontologies, you can support a plenty of uh, nice application that can be used in petroleum exploration. Uh, also, we are working in integrating these to standard patterns like HSKML and PPDM. Uh, so if you want to find us, the easiest is to search my name in reserve, uh, research gate, then you get uh, all our papers or going to our group we call Intelligent Database Group. We are, we are inside of the, the, 
he a group of uh, URGS and also the, the computing system for petroleum exploration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mara. It's a very nice topic. And uh, we have a second one after the um, break, but uh, are there any comments, questions, immediate? Please. We have uh, 50 billion of reais, uh, 50 trillion of reais in oil uh, in Brazil. And this cooperation, uh, Norway have all data of our, that is, uh, to understand this. And the, the possibility to a renewable energy together with this extraction of oil and change the quality of life in Brazil and Norway and the world. Because Norway and Brazil is the only two countries in the world that have energy uh, and the autosufficiencia uh, to futuri. Okay, I think I'll leave the, uh, the answer to the um, roundtable discussion um, because I, we make priority to the um, to the speaker. But I will come back to that. It's a very interesting and challenging issue. Some other comments, questions? Then we leave it to the uh, to the discussion afterwards, and we will have a second one on the same topic after the coffee break. And uh, we have 20 minutes, but please be here exactly 10 past so we can uh, run it timely. <laughs>